Okay. Hi everyone, good afternoon. My name is Evita Tasiopoulou and on behalf of uh, the entire STEMIT team, I would like to first of all thank you for your participation to the course up to this point, but also thank you for joining us for our second uh, webinar, especially on a Friday afternoon. So without uh, any more delay, I would like to pass the floor to our lovely colleagues. Uh, Tassos Hovardas and Nicoleta Xenophodos from University of Cyprus, who are going to tell you all about the learning projects. Enjoy. Uh, thanks, Evita. Hello, everybody. My name is Tassos Hovardas. I'm based at the University of Cyprus and I'm a member of the Research in Science and Technology Education Group. Uh, my presentation today will focus on learning projects and especially how we can use them uh, for assessment purposes. In order to discuss this, we will also discuss learning products in pedagogical design and we will sum up with uh, a slide on how learning products could facilitate stakeholder dialogue. Uh, first of all, let us define learning products. This could be either physical or digital artifacts created by students during a learning activity. Uh, to do so, students usually are supported by tools, templates or scaffolds. Examples of learning products can be drawings, concept maps, hypotheses, experimental designs, data collected in data sheets, graphs, tables, models, uh, anything uh, that could be uh, produced by students as an outcome of a learning activity. Uh, taking learning products uh, as uh, a core uh, aspect of pedagogical design, we can uh, translate a sequence, a sequence of learning activities into a sequence of learning products, meaning that each learning product of, of a former learning activity may be needed as necessary input for processing upcoming activities. Uh, the learning products uh, present a key point for all state-of-the-art learning approaches, meaning that since students create them, uh, we meet a very basic uh, core um, uh, assumption of constructivism uh, uh, in, in, in the meaning that learning is based on what students produce. Uh, students produce the knowledge uh, which is not just given to them, but it is produced by them. Uh, another aspect uh, quite crucial for pedagogical design is that learning products determine the duration of learning activities and the class arrangement. Here we mean uh, the activities, the learning activities, and if they are going to be undertaken on an individual basis, in groups of students, or as whole class activities. We can have different examples of learning products, as we said before. Uh, this can include drawings. I'm having a slight delay with my PowerPoint. OK, uh, this is the concept map. We are still dealing with uh, the examples of um, uh, learning products. We can have a table, a graph, a digital or a paper and pencil graph. We can have tables and we can have models. Uh, these are uh, models created with Stella software. Uh, in terms of assessment, the learning products reflect knowledge and skills necessary for their creation, meaning that if students did not possess this uh, knowledge and skills, then they would not be able to uh, create the products. Um, learning products can be stored in portfolios so that they can be reused later on, uh, either reworked or revised or compared. Uh, and in this regard, learning products can be used to restructure student navigation and performance in the learning environment. They themselves present a history of the learning traje trajectories taken by students. Learning products can be used for different assessment purposes. For instance, in summative assessment, learning products stored in portfolios could be used for certification of skills and competencies. They can also be used in the frame of formative assessment. Uh, where teachers can, can focus on learning products to diagnose student performance and provide on-the-fly feedback. Uh, this means that uh, student uh, teachers would not need any other instrument external to the learning activity sequence. And finally, learning products could also be used for peer assessment purposes. Uh, in this way, students can assess the work of each other, the work of their peers, 
in arrangement which could be reciprocal, meaning that each student would undertake the role of peer assessor and peer assessing. So we can store learning products in portfolios. This is an example of a portfolio with um, uh, learning products from a robotic kit. Uh, Nicoletta will refer extensively to that later on. Um, so we have the, the Genobot a, a vehicle, a, a robot uh, manufactured by Tengino. We can have a drawing, a conditional statement. We can have live readings and a flow diagram created in a software uh, called Cairo with a visual programming language. Uh, an issue here is that we can see uh, the optimization of learning products uh, by programming. For instance, we can uh, have different activities undertaken by this uh, robot. And in, in this way, we can have uh, progressions in our learning activity sequences. We can have uh, learning products of different scales. Uh, what we uh, saw by now is small scale learning products. However, in project based learning, we can have uh, larger scale learning products uh, such as posters with text and pictures, website created by students. Uh, these are examples from uh, STEMIT uh, implementations. We can have different forms of design, again, either paper, pencil or digital designs. We can have models, uh, physical uh, models of, of various kinds. This is a model of a house, model of a city, windmill, of course, we can have data sets and graphs, as we said before, and probably uh, a good example for a large scale learning product is a school garden, provided that it's integrated in uh, learning activity sequences, as we said before. So uh, in taking all this into account, uh, learning products could be useful for um, structuring a stakeholder dialogue, a constructive one. Uh, for instance, teacher, teachers uh, will be able to increase the coherence of their designs and the strengths of their pedagogical designs. And uh, learning products could also foster teacher collaboration in pedagogical design. In terms of uh, students themselves, uh, we have uh, seen in previous research that learning products can facilitate self-regulation, metacognition and transfer of knowledge and skills. Uh, learning products can also be used to scaffold students uh, while working. This can be done in the form of partially worked examples, which can be given to students. Uh, in the case of ministries of education, learning products can be used to exemplify curriculum development and analysis. Actually, we can have collections of learning products as a cur curriculum under development in the form of learning progressions. And we can have also industry partners highlighting desirable skills by concrete reference to learning products. I'm now moving uh, to a very concrete example with insights for developing non-linear thinking. The example will be of how, on how to use learning products for assessment purposes. So the background and rationale is the fact that uh, in terms of systems thinking, we need to develop uh, student competencies in addressing non-linear phenomena. Uh, this is uh, very much needed in ecology we have many systems, for instance, uh, populations by communities uh, and ecosystems operating in terms of uh, uh, systems uh, interactions. Uh, this is why we need to develop non-linear reasoning exactly to let students follow the operation of the systems. And um, in the case of non-linear reasoning, we have a sharp divide between uh, this form of reasoning and linear reasoning. Whereas linear interactions between variables are proportional or inversely proportional uh, and one way in unidirectional, in the term of in the in the uh, case of non-linear relationships, uh, we have uh, non-proportional uh, forms and uh, usually two-way bidirectional uh, bidirectional causality. Uh, this type of causality is crucial for understanding feedback feedback loops in ecological phenomena. So the main questions to be addressed in the following slide is uh, are how can good practice in pedagogical design develop uh, nonlinear thinking? The second question is how can we use learning products within the frame of formative assessment for securing that uh, nonlinear thinking has been developed? And a third main topic is uh, what are the implications of this approach for learning and instruction? In this slide, we see uh, a learning activity sequence for 
um, a game simulation. On the left column, we see the different learning activities. In the middle column, we see the time needed to complete them and the class arrangement where uh, activities could be undertaken on an individual basis in groups of students or if they are whole class activities. On the right column, we see the description of learning products. We can have texts, tables, graphs, etc. So uh, this description uh, can be uh, translated into another language by using the building blocks of learning scenarios uh, with a focus of, on learning products. We see um, in the middle of this scheme the learning activity uh, which leads to learning product and in order for students to create this learning product they need some support in the form of a reference material uh, or further support by teachers or teacher feedback. So if, if we translate uh, what we saw in the table before in this language, we will have this uh, scheme uh, development. This is a learning activity sequence with uh, the yellow color. Uh, we see the rhombuses, which are the learning products. So if we gather them in a portfolio, we can have a recollection of student activities and their learning trajectories. Now, this is what are the basics of the game simulation. On the left, we have uh, different rules of the game, which is played by students. Uh, these rules uh, translate in the game to uh, differential equations used to depict population trends in prey predator systems. We have uh, a group of students playing wolves and another group of students playing deer. Uh, so these are the rules of the game. Uh, the, uh, the one group of students, the wolves, chase deer uh, but each wolf can consume only one deer in its time unit. Uh, each deer consumed is transformed into a wolf. Uh, all wolves consume deer, this is the third rule. And the fourth rule is that if a wolf cannot find a deer to feed on, it is transformed into a deer. Uh, so again, these rules uh, translate uh, the two equations of the Lotka Volterra prey predator system into the uh, game simulation we uh, see in the slide. In the middle part, we see a drawing with uh, fluctuations in population uh, in the population sizes of the two uh, populations played by students, of course, in this game simulation. And we can see that we have uh, fluctuations in time, meaning that uh, the wolves cannot consume all prey because if deer decreases, then uh, wolves uh, do not find deer to feed on. So their numbers also decrease. And if wolf, wolves decrease, then deer have the opportunity to increase as well. So we have uh, recurrent fluctuations, uh, oscillations of population sizes. On the right, we can see a table with uh, the time units and the numbers of wolves and deer in each time unit. So this is a graph we can have based on the table. On the graph, we see again these fluctuations, uh, the oscillations of standard width in time. We see the maxima and minima uh, for each population's uh, remain, remaining standard in time. A main issue here is that the simulation can be played, of course, not only for wolves and deer, but uh, for other forms of interactions like foxes and rabbits. Uh, and uh, students usually in their initial predictions describe these uh, trends as linear monotonous. And uh, what we can see, of course, in the graph is that uh, the prey population does not disappear. And this is an indication that this linear and monotonous uh, kind of thinking is not enough to describe this dynamics, which should be described by nonlinear thinking. However, even when seeing the graph, some students still describe it uh, uh, exactly the population trends as inversely proportional. And this is a kind of regression to linear thinking. Uh, to be able to discuss this, we combined two different learning products, the graph itself and interpretations we have from the graph. Uh, this is an example of how a student uh, interpreted the graph. Uh, she said when the one population increases, the other population decreases. When wolves increase in number, deer decrease. We can see that populations of wolves and deer relate in an inversely proportional way. And this has been uh, interpreted uh, uh, within a frame of the snapshot indicated in the graph. Of course, it's not, it's not correct. Uh, but it exemplifies how we can have a regression to this nonlinear thinking. So when we analyze our results from uh, the learning products further, we saw that if participants had identified maximum uh, and or minimum values, or if they had observed the temporal pattern of oscillations, this 
recurrent oscillations, then they were significantly less likely to resort to linear unidirectional uh, reasoning. Uh, this is a tree diagram, a uh, quite complex one, so I won't go into uh, much detail in it, but two main points we need to highlight. The first one is that if participants had observed maximum and minimum values, then uh, they had most probably progressed to nonlinear reasoning. However, if they, uh, even if they uh, recorded the maintenance of both hoofs and deer in the, this hypothetical biotope, they could still describe uh, the population trends as inversely proportional, and when doing so, they were most probable to not have progressed to nonlinear reasoning. So what are the implications for learning and instruction? Uh, first of all, we can use concrete aspects of concrete learning products to provide clear evidence of either progression, stagnation, or even regression of uh, learners. And this is uh, very much needed in terms of enacting formative assessment. We saw the example before the students who concentrated on the space delineated by maximum and minimum values on this short uh, uh, space within the, the graph, they uh, interpreted the trend sense as inversely proportional. Uh, and uh, this is wrong, of course, because uh, proportionality uh, in our case would be only possible to a certain if, you, if we used another type of diagram, not a time diagram, but scatter plot, plotting, uh, meaning to plot the, the prey predator uh, according to the uh, predator population. Uh, so this would be the, the example of such a scatter plot. This is created again by uh, the Stella software. Uh, this is a kind of online uh, simulation, so we can use the game simulation together with the online simulation and create this uh, accumulating uh, portfolios of students uh, to let them reflect on, on their work. Uh, this is uh, the model created by Stella uh, for the prey predator system. And this is a digital graph depicting these oscillations of standard width for each, uh, for each population. So if we combine the game simulation with uh, the computer simulation, the uh, online simulation, we could have a very good approximation of uh, different types of aspects in, in the uh, population trends of the different populations. Uh, what is again crucial is the fact that uh, we have um, very powerful linear heuristics uh, which may uh, reach to the point of distorting novel information even within the same uh, lesson uh, for students. Um, and this linear heuristic, uh, heuristics may resurface even when targeted by instruction. Uh, another crucial point is that there is the possibility that schooling itself might be contradictory and that the curriculum may promote divergent objectives. Uh, for instance, we can have uh, the establishment of linear thinking in physics and at the same time, in the same year, in the same curriculum, we can have uh, a goal for establishing non-linear thinking in ecology. So using graphing should not be uh, only uh, made for approaching linear and proportional relationships because this could be counterintuitive uh, and graphs and graph descriptions uh, can be instrumental in either challenging or perpetuating uh, linear reasoning. In any case, uh, curriculum design and development should incorporate in comparison among scientific domains and fields like we can have uh, in the case of nature of science approaches. And all this discussion can be facilitated very well uh, with student portfolios and learning products stored in student portfolios. These are the references where our work has been uh, based. Uh, and I have a couple of questions for later on for during the discussion uh, section. So uh, let's leave it for the time being. Uh, and I'm now going to give the floor uh, to uh, Nicoletta for uh, the rest of uh, the presentations. Thank you, Tasso. I will open my presentation now. Okay. Um, hello and thank you for joining us in this uh, live event. I hope you all get something uh, from today's presentation that would help you in your uh, teaching practice. 
My name is uh, Nicoletta and I work with TASOS in the same uh, research group at the University of Cyprus. I have a background in primary education and I specialize in the teaching and learning in science uh, at every educational level. And in this presentation, I will try to highlight the importance of assessing student learning portfolio, especially in the context of uh, an integrated STEM approach. But uh, first, I would like you to think of an architect who applied for a job and the time for her interview has arrived. What will she take with her in her briefcase in order to showcase her work and skills? Well, she will definitely take her drawings and designs, which may be printed or electronic. In an analogous way, a mechanical engineer may present a video demonstration of his constructions. A researcher will carry with him publications or references of his research work. And the software engineer may present the web applications and websites she designed and monitored. So in other words, all these experts will create their portfolios which tell a story about their skills in their field. In the educational setting, a learning portfolio is a collection of student work that showcases student progress, achievements, and competences. The learning portfolio is a powerful complement to traditional measures of student achievement and a widely diverse method of uh, recording intellectual growth. It provides uh, aggregated information about uh, student learning and showcases evidence of uh, what specific learning goals students achieved. It allows teachers to monitor student progress and provide formative uh, assessment and students to reflect on their learning. It can be presented to parents and uh, to the next teacher in the following grade as proof of what students achieved. It can be scored based on rubrics which include assessment criteria that match the uh, intended learning uh, objectives. And of course, uh, the most important thing is that students are involved in the creation of their learning portfolios, uh, which support the uh, assessment and collaboration. In the next slide, slides, I choose some uh, examples of learning products from the classroom implementations of our STEMI teachers in order to say a few words on what story they tell us about student achievement. This is the example from the primary education group of teachers uh, from Cyprus about the solar system and the Earth. In this learning scenario, students explore the conditions in other planets of our solar system in order to examine whether humans can live there in the future if the conditions on Earth become unfriendly for living life. During the second lesson, students read uh, some articles related to the topic under investigation, created a mind map, and wrote some uh, notes based on um, uh, some uh, given guiding questions. These learning products, meaning the mind map and the notes, can be stored in the student's portfolio and students and or teacher can access them at any time for reflection and assessment purposes. And if we check the learning goals uh, for this specific lesson, we can see that the first two goals can be addressed directly. And of course, the teacher can review these learning products on the fly and provide constructive feedback in the context of formative assessment. So far, so good, but how the other two learning goals can be addressed. Let's keep that in mind for, for, for the next slide. So the final learning product in this integrated STEM uh, learning scenario is a fact-based article uh, that students wrote during the language class about whether humans can live in, uh, um, uh, can live in another planet uh, if the conditions on Earth become less friendly. To do so, students were prompted to use information from previous learning products. 
Now, if we look at the learning goals of this specific lesson of, uh, of uh, this scenario, we realize that the first learning goal is actually a combination of the two previous goals. So with the final article, the final learning product of this uh, learning scenario, uh, the teacher is able to evaluate whether uh, the specific objectives have been achieved. And in terms of uh, the second goal, uh, students' ability to reflect, this can be examined um, by uh, review students' completed self-reflection forms. Now, if we look at all the previous learning products in combination, we can have a better picture of whether other aims of the learning scenario have been achieved, such as the 21st century skills set by the teachers during the design of the learning scenario. In this example, the selected three learning products provide some uh, indications as to whether students are able to analyze interpret, compare and evaluate different data to seek and validate evidence and make use of new knowledge to write a scientific article and argue in which planet humans uh, could live in the future. In another example of a learning scenario implemented by our friends in Sweden, students were asked to design and build a sustainable house following an engineering design challenge. Then they experimented with electricity in the physics classroom in order to light up their houses. And finally, they designed a website to advert their company and houses. And here we can see examples of learning products, among which is a screenshot of a digital drawing of the house, a video of a real model of a house, and a screenshot of a website a group of students uh, designed. All these types of learning products can be used in uh, students' learning portfolios and can be evaluated in relation to the learning goals set uh, for this learning scenario. However, what I would like to highlight from this uh, example is that for every learning product, electronic files can be generated and stored in an electronic uh, learning portfolio. And the e-learning portfolio can be either stored locally or uh, in a cloud uh, service. Before concluding uh, this presentation, I want to provide uh, also two examples of uh, how we can assess collaboration skills. Uh, which cannot be evaluated directly by examining uh, students' learning products. Here is an example of a collaboration rubric uh, that the teacher might use to evaluate each uh, student's uh, collaboration and communication skills. But uh, if it is too hard to complete this rubric for every student, then it might be useful to train students to do it uh, by themselves. For example, this is an online application uh, available in the GOLA platform in which uh, students grade themselves and others based on given criteria for uh, respectful, intelligent collaboration where students work together and encourage each uh, others. So in summary, the important thing that we can keep from this uh, presentation is that the learning portfolio is a powerful means of assessment and it can include a selection of so many different types uh, of learning products. And for closing, I, I will try to address a question posted by many of, uh, of you in the Padlet as a preparation for this live event, which is uh, if there are any tools that can help in uh, storing accessing and sharing learning products, especially during this hard time that we are all facing with the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, well, so far a useful tool that provides powerful features for these purposes is the GOLA platform. It includes uh, learning analytics uh, apps that help teachers to monitor learning in real time 
It has collaboration apps that allow students to work simultaneously on the same learning product and uh, uh, communicate at the same time. And it gives the option to export an electronic lesson in the form of an ebook, which is, uh, in other words, uh, consists the student learning portfolio. So if you don't know GoLab, you can uh, visit the the website www.colabs.eu and learn more about its uh, uh, resources and uh, features. And this is the uh, the sites from which I took the images for this presentation. Uh, and I will proceed now to my second presentation. Um, OK, so in my second presentation, uh, I will present an example of an integrated STEM learning scenario we designed in our research group in the context of a project on educational robotics. Uh, the emphasis, however, will be on uh, certain learning products that uh, can be used uh, for peer assessment purposes. Uh, the Genome Bot uh, project is uh, funded by the Cypriot uh, Research and Innovation Foundation and the coordinator of the project is Engino, a manufacturing company in the field of uh, learning toys based in Cyprus. The learning scenarios we are developing uh, integrate educational robotics with K-based learning, inquiry-based learning and engineering design. This is uh, the GenomeBot, an innovative robotic platform uh, with uh, built-in electronics such as uh, motors and uh, sensors and with high expansion potential since it allows the addition of third-party electronics and hardware like a Raspberry Pi, Arduino and uh, Micronbit. Besides its, uh, it, its internal sensors and expandability, it is also compatible with the Engino building system to construct larger and more sophisticated robots such as uh, Hexabot, uh, Excavator and uh, others. To introduce this uh, robot to students in the upper secondary education, we designed the math uh, challenge learning scenario and bundle of uh, three lessons. The main idea of the learning scenario is to program the genome bot so that it can scan effectively an unexplored and unknown surface in Mars in order to identify the location of areas of interest or concern. In the first lesson, after watching a short video about the mission of the NASA's Curiosity rovers to Mars, Students are asked to find a way to make their robot move over the entire surface and at the same time use the internal sensor uh, of the Genobot to screen the surface and identify rocky areas represented as uh, red cells on a grid, for example, and dusty hills represented as green cells on a grid. Thus, if the, grid, if the grid on the left uh, is, is the unknown surface, then the robot uh, is expected to make the route shown on the right in order to scan the whole area. To be able to program the GenoBot, students uh, use uh, the Cairo software, a user-friendly scratch-like programming software designed by, by Engino and they learn about how to incorporate the necessary sensors and blocks such as the color sensor, the buzzer and the conditional statements. And this is an example of a learning product that students may create in Cairo. According to this flow diagram, the robot checks all the time if it detects red or green color and plays a different sound. Otherwise, uh, no sound is played. This is possible by means of, a, of the function block, named uh, as uh, check color in the, in the example, uh, which uh, runs in parallel with the movement of the robot. 
And here we can see an alternative flow diagram. In this case, the robot makes uh, steps and after each uh, step, it, it, uh, it checks if there is a red or a green color or none of them and play a different sound each time. So in this example, we see that the function uh, does not run in parallel with the movement of the robot, but uh, runs after each uh, step. In the second lesson, after screening the, the Mars surface, meaning the grid, students must draw a line uh, for robots to move on the surface in order to avoid the rocky areas, the red cells, but pass over dusty hills, the green cells, where the genobolt must stay for a few seconds uh, for further exploration. And this is a possible solution for, for the line following challenge in Cairo. Again, uh, students may end up with uh, different solutions. And because of this, it, is, uh, it will be very meaningful to engage students in peer assessment so that they can see and evaluate uh, alternative solutions to the same problem. Therefore, in the third lesson, students are assigned the role of uh, peer assessors and uh, peer assessees. Each group evaluates if the identification of the location of the red and green cells by another peer student group was correct. Moreover, they evaluate if the line follow program of the SSC group worked correctly. To do so, they must exchange the care of flow diagrams and the grid uh, papers with the uh, red and green uh, areas. Um, and then they can run this program in their computer using their genome bots and see uh, if uh, the behavior of the robot is as planned. And for this purpose, they can use a checklist or an evaluation rubric. And in addition, they can write uh, construct constructive feedback uh, for their peers. So the peer assessment process gives the opportunity to the students to, to improve their work and then conclude the lesson. And in this example, students conclude the lesson by creating a short documentary video about their mission and uh, by reflecting on the possible next steps for continuing the Mars uh, challenge in uh, upcoming lessons. Concluding this uh, presentation, peer assessment is a reciprocal process during which learners provide feedback to each other based on a set of assessment criteria. And this process, uh, for, that per for that reason, this process is characterized as a type of collaboration learning uh, since uh, students will uh, see alternative solutions, al alternative learning products other than uh, theirs. And uh, peer assessment has, has been found to have a positive impact on uh, student self-reflection and metacognitive skills. And these are some uh, references for uh, further reading regarding peer assessment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to Nicoletta and Tassos. This was uh, very interesting. I hope that our learners um, now know better how to fill out their uh, learning scenarios and how to implement um, the learning products in their uh, learning uh, scenarios. Um, I would also like to thank our uh, MOOC participants for all the questions that they submitted in our Padlet. We collected quite a few. Unfortunately, we won't have time to go through all, uh, all of them, of course. Uh, we tried to pick the ones that came most frequently. Um, so uh, I will address first the Tassos. Um, our first question for you is, what is the teacher's role uh, uh, in learning product? And more specifically, 
what is um, a teacher's role in supporting um, students during this uh, remote teaching that a lot of uh, teachers are going through right now? Uh, thanks, Elena. Uh, first of all, the, the teacher's role uh, in in the um, ways the uh, the lesson plans are usually uh, constructed and planned uh, is the one prescribed by inquiry-based learning and project-based learning. So the teacher's role is the role of a facilitator, uh, of course, provided that uh, the proper pedagogical design has been made before. So. Uh, during instruction, what teachers do is to follow, to monitor the progress of students. Uh, and this is why uh, uh, we gave too much weight to uh, formative assessment, which is a kind of monitoring of student navigation and performance so that uh, teachers can intervene uh, when this is needed and uh, redirect uh, student trajectories if they deviate from constructive routes. Um, so this is how I would describe the teacher's role. And of course, uh, in, in uh, the times we now face these restrictions with uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, there are several uh, ways of uh, uh, making and transition to what we call digital classroom. Uh, and we can have several platforms. Nicoletta referred already to the GoLab platform. In this case, we have laboratories, virtual laboratories. We have we have uh, applications, online applications, so that student can, uh, students can create learning products online and store them. Uh, so uh, pretty much everything that was running in a physical, traditional classroom can in one way or another be transferred to this kind of uh, online digital classroom so that we can uh, go on with STEM experimentation during uh, the COVID era. Yes, indeed. I'm just about to share the link to GoLabs um, in the chat. So for all our um, learners who are not familiar, although I believe most of them are, please yeah, go and visit and you, uh, there you can find, as Tassos mentioned, different apps, labs, also ready to use uh, kind of learning scenarios or create your own. Uh, so, Tassos, you already covered my second question there that was uh, about tools. So you already mentioned some during your presentation. Um, I don't know if maybe Nicoletta um, has some other tools to add. If not, we can uh, continue with Nicoletta. Is there anything else you would like to add in terms of tools? Well, besides Colab, which actually combines many features that can help with the distance uh, learning, I believe that teachers may find um, more simple ways to, to monitor distance learning. For example, if they want, they can share a Google Doc with, their, with students and students can uh, start writing simultaneously uh, a text, for example, which is again a learning product. Uh, the only problem that I see in this case is that with uh, younger students, uh, there are restrictions in creating uh, email accounts. So uh, many of these uh, tools, they can be used by them. So this is the only uh, problem that I see. And the, the advantage of GoLab in that uh, case is that teachers do not need an account and they can use the, the lesson immediately and their learning products can be stored in a, in a teacher environment and teacher can see all the learning products with his account. So uh, for younger students, I think that Colab actually solves many issues that has to do with uh, GDPR issues uh, with email accounts and so on. Uh, other than this, I'm not aware of any other uh, tool that have all these uh, uh, features at the moment. Maybe in the future we'll see many to come up after this uh, situation we face these days. We can hear you, Yelena. Yes, Yelena, you're muted. Oh, sorry. Sorry about that. I had myself muted while Nicoletta was speaking. So indeed, uh, there are not so many um, places, but uh, at least 
we know is a good place to start. Um, uh, maybe Nicoletta, we can go uh, back to the point that you made about uh, primary school teachers. We also received a lot of questions about primary or even pre-primary uh, students. Uh, how can we go about learning parallels with younger students, not just in remote teaching, but in um, also in a classroom setting? Maybe Nicoletta, you can tell us something about it. That's as you're also welcome to um, add to it as well. Well, anything that students create uh, during any activities uh, in a real classroom or in a digital lesson can be considered as a learning product. So uh, teachers can store them either as uh, physical uh, products, meaning, uh, for example, a piece of paper with uh, students' drawings or text, uh, or, as I said in my um, presentation, all these files can be transferred in electronic ones. I mean, we can take pictures of uh, the real uh, uh, learning products and store them in uh, electronic files uh, in our computer or in a cloud service. So for each student, we can create their learning portfolios and uh, access it uh, at any time we want to review students' uh, progress, students' achievements, and we can uh, actually um, uh, present these uh, portfolios to, to their parents if they ask for, to, to other teachers. Uh, so I believe for every level, for every educational level, we can use this um, uh, facilities, the technology that we are uh, using in our daily lives, we can use it in order to, to make uh, learning more uh, easy and accessible to everyone. Yes, indeed. And then in terms of uh, learning product itself, maybe uh, Tassos, uh, what will be your suggestions for younger students? You mentioned some drawings and posters. So I'm guessing something to that effect for the younger students. Uh, yes, actually, I, I would start with um, a kind of uh, question myself so that we can reflect on that. Uh, if, if we now thought about uh, what would be the, the signs, the milestones to uh, showcase the learning of students during a school year, uh, in, in, in several cases, we may end up with, uh, uh, you know, a block of uh, sheets, exam sheets with uh, students just filling in questions, exam uh, replying to exam questions. Um, however, the, the, the classrooms, uh, the school practice, what uh, uh, students do at schools is much richer. So this is what we aim to do. We aim to uh, document the rich experience students may have uh, in schools and uh, that to be documented, we of course need much more than the final exams, the final uh, papers completed by students. And this is the whole idea behind learning projects. We may start with simple things. Uh, of course, simple uh, is, is uh, taking to the note in, in many cases, uh, things that have to do with age, but they could be rich as well. Uh, a drawing of, of a young child, of a young student may be uh, quite rich for us to see what has been learned and what has not uh, been successful in terms of design or implementation. So I believe that the main uh, weight of pedagogical design and implementation should be shifted towards this showcasing of uh, student progress through uh, the learning products. We can have many examples. The uh, example I presented with the pre-predator system is a role-playing game that uh, can be started at least in its beginnings, even from lower primary education. So even from these ages, we can have uh, an introduction of uh, students into uh, this documentation of, of the rich uh, school class experiences in the form of, of learning products. And you know, uh, this also creates a kind of uh, a reflection which is very much beneficial for students and teachers because we we can recollect, we can uh, have uh, uh, a reflection and uh, uh, a reconsideration of the learning trajectories because we have the history of, of these trajectories in our hands in the form of learning products. Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, I think this uh, kind of also ties nicely to our next question about integration in curriculum. 
I think the way that you describe the process, that was actually can be easily implemented into curriculum. Would you like to add something more on the, that topic? Curriculum uh, integration of... If, uh, in, yeah. Yes, if I may, the, uh, I suppose that the biggest challenge there is twofold. W one thing is that uh, uh, teachers would need more time to devote in pedagogical planning uh, pedagogical design that they uh, than they currently do and I can very well understand that this is especially challenging today where all teachers uh, strive to um, uh, proceed to the transition from the traditional classroom to digital classrooms but I strongly believe that we need more time to devote on pedagogical design and this needs to be acknowledged by all stakeholders I would add uh, uh, this is the, this is why we need uh, constructive stakeholder dialogue based on learning products. This is one thing. And another thing is that uh, all levels of education uh, have uh, many benefits to expect from uh, what we call in the STEMIT project integrated STEM learning, because this is what actually what we actually do. The separation of different domains is more or less artificial for uh, reasons that uh, they were very, uh, very well needed some years ago, but uh, nowadays I strongly believe that we could proceed to this um, integrated STEM uh, approaches, but uh, for this to, um, to happen again we need uh, a large scale reconsideration of our curriculum and uh, a reconsideration of how we could overcome, uh, you know, the, the separatist uh, approach in different domains. It has been called the silo approach because each different domain is handled separately. So these are the challenges, I suppose, that are linked, uh, that are linked and, and engage teachers, students, and other stakeholders like ministries of education, but industry partners as well. Yes, uh, exactly. So that also kind of brings me to our next question and maybe uh, Nicoletta can uh, expand on it a bit more. So we received a question about is it uh, necessary to have a single uh, learning product or a, a combination of it, especially when it comes to integrated approach or incorporating different um, pedagogical um, approaches such as um, project-based learning or inquiry-based learning. So Nicoletta, you mentioned uh, not just the uh, learning product, but the learning portfolio. So uh, maybe you can uh, then expand on that in terms of uh, implementation in interdisciplinary um, cases. Yes, of course. As I shown in, in my presentation, uh, some uh, learning goals, some learning objectives cannot be um, assessed by examining only one learning product, especially those uh, learning uh, objectives that, that have to do with uh, student uh, skills and competences in, for example, the 21st century yeah. skills, how can we assess them? We need to see the learning portfolio, we need to see uh, the student's reflection or the student's um, uh, collabor uh, collaboration uh, rubrics, uh, completed collaboration rubrics in order to have a, a bigger picture of uh, what they achieve. And on the other hand, I would also like to, to say that uh, we saw that um, from the same learning activity, many uh, different learning products may um, uh, produced by students, meaning that uh, different students may, uh, let's say, uh, create uh, or uh, follow a different approach in order to create the, their learning products, and that will might result in uh, multiple uh, solutions uh, in a in a challenge, and and also this is very very important because uh, we can use these uh, different products for assessment, peer assessment purposes and uh, provide the students the opportunity to, to see others' uh, perspective uh, and uh, evaluate it or maybe adapt things that they think are better in uh, learning products of others uh, and uh, adapt there in order to make it better, let's say. I don't know if Dasus has something to add at this point. Uh, just
That's what we can't hear you. Yes, yes. It's, uh, I was saying that uh, we, Nicoletta, have a, a common uh, experience in, in uh, our group at the University of Cyprus. But uh, in any case, I suppose that uh, we can make a distinction between large scale uh, learning projects, which is uh, uh, encountered when we have project based learning. Then we uh, usually we present the end product, which is, uh, you know, the reflection of all our efforts. Uh, but in many cases, we can make use of smaller uh, learning products. For instance, if we uh, uh, devote time to pedagogical design and inquiry based learning, then we need to start with some kind of hypothesis or question, then move on to an experimental design, then collect some data with a simulation or a laboratory, and then we can analyze this data, etc. So we can have uh, a collection of learning products, a series out of it. So. Uh, uh, the portfolio is needed either in, in the first case with the project or in the second case with a smaller uh, scale learning project in, in, in any way. Uh, I believe this is the way to move forward in, in order to be able to establish uh, the integrated STEM approach because, you know, uh, uh, we could have uh, alternative ways. We could discuss them in terms of assessment, for instance, the questionnaires either open ended or closed ended. But uh, we believe it, it's very difficult to assess uh, integrated STEM unless we move towards the direction of, of learning products. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, we received a question here in the chat. Um, a question is about Padlet as a tool for students to collaborate and reflect upon their progress. Uh, I believe in our MOOC we have an example of uh, Padlet as a learning product. So, of course, it can be used. I don't know if um, Nicoletta or Tassos have anything to add to that, your experience. They are nodding, so I think they agree uh, that yeah, for sure it could be used. Uh, I have one last question uh, for our speakers. Uh, maybe we can start uh, with Tassos. Uh, I found this question particularly interesting and I think it lands itself very well in terms of um, project based learning or inquiry based learning is can students be in charge of uh, selecting uh, the learning product? What is your opinion about that? Yes, of course, just let me add the point on the previous uh, question on the Padlet. Uh, the, the learning products could be collaborative. It's, it's not that each student creates a product so we can have collaboration between students and uh, this is again a, a challenge for the digital classroom especially. Uh, so it, it adds to the uh, problematization during pedagogical design. Uh, to come back to uh, uh, what you said uh, in, in, in your second uh, question, uh, uh, students should have a decisive role if we speak about inquiry-based learning or project-based learning. Uh, the, the inquiry approach may be slightly more structured because we have uh, a sequence of steps to reach to a conclusion, but even, even in the case of inquiry, students should take the responsibility of the learning courses. So uh, this is this is why, why we said before that uh, the role of the teacher is a facilitator's role. Uh, and if, if uh, he or she manages uh, to give this uh, responsibility to students, then uh, the, the benefits, the, the outcomes, the learning outcomes are much more pronounced and uh, stay longer. Uh, they are maintained longer in time. So in any case, uh, uh, this is uh, again uh, the way uh, to proceed by giving the students the responsibility. And this is much more easy, I believe, and much more established as a practice in project based learning. Uh, of course, we may not consider projects uh, real classroom experience, but uh, I believe this is our problem and not the problem of students or, or, or the approach itself. Well, uh, thank you. Um, thank you both, Tassos and Nicoletta. This was uh, very informative. Um, we only have one minute left, so I will use this opportunity to remind our participants that we will open module four, our final module on Monday. So get ready for uh, our own peer assessment. Nicoletta talked about the importance of peer assessment, so you also get to experience it firsthand in our MOOC. Uh, maybe use this weekend as an opportunity to work within your teams uh, now that you know everything what you need to know about uh, learning products. So 
maybe you can work on incorporating that in your uh, learning scenario so that you are all ready to go on Monday when we open our final uh, module. Um, as I don't see any other questions in the chat, I think that uh, that's all what we have for you today. I uh, hope you enjoyed the webinar. Uh, the recording uh, together with the slides, um, they will be available uh, on Monday. So in case you miss uh, something or you want to revisit any of the tools that Nicoletta Tassos mentioned, you will be able to do so on Monday when we share the slides. Uh, thank you again to our speakers, Tassos and Nicoletta. Thank you to my colleagues, Evita and Eleni, who were there in the background helping. Um, and to all of you, I wish you a pleasant evening and a good weekend and um, see you again next week for our teach meets as well. Don't forget that. Have a good evening. Thank you. Have a good evening. Bye. Bye. Bye.